Hello everyone and welcome to the latest in our webinar series, Discovering Genetic Variants to Unlock Treatment Solutions. In today's webinar, we have with us Dr. Haber Hosni, a medical genetic liaison and center gene. During the webinar, she will discuss the following topics. The power of HPO terms and clinical data in diagnostics, characterizing novel disorders and disease-causing genes with the next generation sequencing, NGS, driving medical decision with a whole exome sequencing. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A chat and we will refer back to them at the end of the presentation. It promised to be a very interesting webinar, so let us begin. Haber, the stage is yours. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Heba Hosni, Medical Genetic Liaison of Centro Genes, and it will be my pleasure today to present you this interesting case studies through which we can highlight together, <clears throat> through which we can highlight together the impact of whole exome sequencing on the discovery of new genes, also the impact of whole exome sequencing on driving the medical decision, and how uh, many tools are integrated together to increase the diagnostic utility of the whole exome sequencing. So starting our presentations today with highlighting our missions, our goal is rapid medical diagnosis of inherited disease while converting our huge analytic information into actionable results for physicians, patients, and pharmaceutical partner partners. Our commitment to the global medical community is to provide an early and accurate diagnosis, seeking the continuous improvement of therapeutic options for each particular patient. Our job doesn't just end by delivering a medical diagnosis, this is done by the collaborations of more than 60 medical experts, geneticists, and researchers working together with partners around the world, all aiming at the end of transforming the global genetic data into medical decisions. So our presentation today will be divided into three main parts. The first part is considered with the discussions of the clinical case itself, including the medical history, the family pedigree, the paraclinical diagnostic approach, the second part is considered with the discussion of the whole exome sequencing workflow design and the impact of HBO terms and increasing its diagnostic utility. The last part will be considered about the strategy of discovery and the discovery of new genes in genetic disorders. The whole exome sequencing considered as invaluable tool for driving the medical decisions and its therapeutic implications. So we're starting our presentation with the fa our family case whose both parents are non-consanguineous, healthy, getting first to a male a child who is completely normal till the age of three years. Then he starts to manifest with the presentations uh, presenting with cerebellar ataxia manifestations in the form of diplopia, dysarthria, walking difficulties, intermittent status of reduced alertness, dysphagia, and cognitive impairment. The course was fluctuating between exacerbations and remissions. The, unfortunately, he died at the age of six years, secondary to suffocations. This from more than 15 years ago, with no available medical records and no available DNA samples. Again, the family experienced getting birth to a third female SEP that was completely normal till the age of 22 years old. She started to present with manifestations of intermittent headache, non-specific visual and speech disturbance, depressions. The course was rapidly progressive with cognitive decline, confusions, for business, nystagmus, evoked by the gaze, tetraspasticity, unexplained febrile relapses, and intractable seizures to treatment. History of ICU admissions requiring tracheostomy and gastrostomy. Investigations was done in the form of muscle biopsy showing no signs of mitochondrial dysfunctional. CSF lactate level was normal. Brain and spinal MRI was normal and also normal of sal muscle. The family also get birth to a fourth female sub that was completely also normal till the age of 20 years, manifesting with episodes of cerebellar ataxia and behavioral disorders, subsides after a few weeks. The second episode was triggered by consumptions of tetrahydroxycanopinol. Four months later, she presenting with headache, intermittent vertigo, hypokinesia, cognitive impairment, cerebellar ataxia, chorea, and myoclonus. 15 months later, after alcohol consumption, she developed organic psychosis with visual and acoustic hallucination, delirium and anxiety, behavioral disturbance, intermittent catatonic stupor, and intermittent comatose status. Investigations was done in the form of brain MRI and MRS was normal. Skin examinations for Lafora body was normal. Unfortunately, she died at the age of 22 years old, secondly to pulmonary embolism 
and postpartum examinations confirmed severe hypoxic brain damage. So here in this slide, we are going to discuss the general scheme for selecting the most appropriate test according to the clinical presentations of my patients. So I have main, two main uh, big categories, and I will ask myself the first question, which category my patient is confined and related to? If my patient is presenting with, the, is my patient presenting with distinctive clinical features, or there is a family history of specific disorder, or my a patient is presenting with heterogenic presentations, like he had hematological, nephrological, or neurological uh, manifestations, and or he had a, a prod spectrum or prod uh, manifestations like autism and intellectual disability, in which many genes and different mode of inheritance are implicated with them, dysmorphic or he having a dysmorphic features, or there is no gene panel available. So if my patient is related to the first category with distinctive clinical features or specific genetic disorder running in the family, then I can ask myself the second questions. With the, what are the most common mutations is, uh, associated with my disorder? Is it a single nucleotide variant and deletion duplication mutations? So I can select the single gene sequencing complemented with MELBA or CMB for detection of deletion duplication. Whether my disorder is related to the category of triplet repeat expansions, and so I can select the appropriate methodology for detection of triplet repeat abnormality, uh, like restrictions fragment length polymorphism, like for instance, in case of fragile mental retardation. And if my disorder is related to the epigenetic disorders with methylation abnormality and imprinting abnormality, so I can select the appropriate test detecting methylation abnormality, which is the missile sensitive and the gold standard method, which is the missile sensitive MELBA, like for instance, in case of Bradley Billy, Angel Man, Russell Silver, and Vickers Weidman syndrome. So the other, the other side, if my disorder or this, this distinctive clinical presentations like ataxia or epilepsy, many genes are involved with them. So I have to select a test that simultaneously can testing many genes at one time, complemented with CMV, and the most appropriate and the matching uh, test is the NGS gene panel. So if my patient is related to the second category, which is heterogenic presentations or prod presentations like autism or intellectual disability, or you have in dysmorphic features, or there is no available gene panel for the, my, the clinical presentations of my patients. So I can start my working with uh, microarray or shallow whole genome deletion duplication analysis, or I can select a comprehensive test like the whole exome or the most comprehensive test and the first tier diagnostic test, which is the whole genome. And both of them, whole exome and whole genome, had an impact on the discovery of new genes. What was requested in our case is the whole exome sequencing. So here in this slide, we are going to discuss some technical basis regarding the whole exome sequencing. It's based on the next generation sequencing technology associated with the analysis of the exons and the exon entry boundaries. This is for 20,000, done for 20,000 genes representing the coding regions and the exon entry boundaries representing 1-2% of the genomes, but it is associated with 85% of the disease coding mutations. So what are the clinical criteria of selection? What are the clinical selections criteria for the whole exome sequencing? Uh, if my patient is presenting first, if my patient is presenting with genetic or clinical heterogeneity, he has, for instance, uh, hematological, as we mentioned, nephrological or neurological presentations, or he has uh, prod manifestation like uh, deafness. There is many type genes related to deafness, and there is different mode of inheritance also implicated the, within uh, the disorder. Or he had a typical presentation like, uh, for instance, uh, presenting with intracranial aneurysm as in cases of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Or he had the combined presentations. He had immune deficiency with intellectual disability. Or in other situations, he had prefer, uh, performed previously a genetic testing like single gene or panel that was negative. And so I have to proceed with a more comprehensive test. Or in most, many situations, the physicians and the patients prefer to start with a comprehensive test from the beginning, but lower cost alternative to the whole genome sequencing. So they select the whole exome sequence. So what are the different designs of the whole exome sequencing? We have the solo, for which can be performed to the index. We have the DEO, which can be performed to two affected, 
or in alternative scenario can be performed to the uh, in X-linked disorders to the mother and the affected male child for confirmation of mode of inheritance and the segregation of variants in X-linked disorders. We have the trio which can be performed to the index and post parents and it's preferred uh, as it is uh, informative regarding the mode of inheritance, the segregation of variants and big classifications in many situations of variants. And finally, we have the trio plus, which is the similar to the trio with adding on other uh, SEP to the test. Here in this slide and the coming slide, we are going to discuss the workflow of the whole exome sequencing. Uh, the first step and the last step is uh, at the physician side. The first step is associated with drawing of the sample and uploading of the data. Drawing of the sample uh, is done and sent through the Centro card. Centro card is familiar to many of you who are requesting tests through the Centro genes. It is a filtered card consisting of 10 circles to which we can dump the blood drawn, uh, from the patients. It's safe and easy for transportation, tolerable to temperatures, and non infectious. Also, the Centro portal is essential for the uploading of the data, clinical information. Uh, the Centro portal is designed in a very easy way, assuring the accuracy and the rapid uploading of the data uh, and the clinical information related to the patients by the physicians in a very rapid time, because we will discuss later that this uh, clinical information is very important you, uh, regarding how to uh, it impact the diagnostic utility of the test itself. Then we come to the step of uh, when we receive the sample of the, through the Centro card and the uh, data through the Centro portal, we start proceeding with the sample in our labs by extractions of the exons and the exons entrance boundaries. And then we perform the sequencing Illumina through the Illumina platform and the bioinformatic analysis by uh, finding the single nucleotide variants, small insertion deletions, and the copy number variants. And then finally, the annotation process. What is different in uh, the process of the whole genome from the whole exome? In the whole exome sequencing, we are not doing extractions of the exons or the exon entrance boundaries. We are doing, not doing the amplifications. It's uniform coverage of the whole genome, including the coding and the non-coding region. And so there is no enrichment and there is no amplifications bias. When we come to the process of the annotations, it is not the easy way one that we imagine. It is a very difficult and sophisticated. As we can see, it's like finding a needle in a needle high stick. It's with every whole exome sequencing, we can imagine that we can have more than 80,000 variants. So how can I detect the most appropriate and select the most appropriate one according to the clinical presentation of my patients? This is a very difficult process requiring the integrations of many tools. So the most important tool of them is the clinical data sent from the physician side and the HPO term. The clinical information is helping in prioritizations and annotations and filtrations of the variants. In addition also to the mode of inheritance suspected and expected from the family pedigree. In addition, also other tools, including the frequency on populations, if the variant is higher in the uh, in, in population, uh, in frequency in populations, it's not most commonly to be associated with the disease. Uh, we are expecting to find very low frequency of these variants in the populations. Also, the CELICO predictions and its predictive, uh, the predictive tools. Uh, in addition, also the external mutational database, human genomic mutation database, and the CLINIBAR, and also in house database, which is the CENTO MD, the largest repository of data all around the world. Our CENTO MD includes 7.3 million variants from more than 120 countries uh, diff ensuring different senators, more than 350 patients tested till now, and 58% of these variants are unique. This ensuring, of course, the accuracy and the reliability of our results, and also the decreasing, uh, decreasing the uncertainty for the physician and the patients, which is the crucial uh, for uh, having an appropriate results at the end. And so finally, we come to the annotations and finding prioritizations of variants and finding the most potential and the most matching one with the patient's uh, clinical pictures. And uh, we do the medical interpretation, issuing the medical report and sending back to the physicians through the central portal. So what is the HPO terms and what is the meaning of the HPO terms? The HPO terms is a standardized vocabulary of phenotypic abnormality found in human genetic syndrome 
each term standing from one abnormal, uh, uh, one phenotypic abnormality. Uh, it's uh, uh, facilitating also the phenotype genotype correlations. For instance, atrial septal defect, it is uh, HBO terms related to the cardiac malformations. In addition also to this clinical information, uh, HBO terms, we need a clinical deta details uh, regarding the course of the disease. We, get, we need the age of onset, the natural history, the family history, and response of treatment. All this valuable information will also affect the prioritization of the variants and helping us to find the most appropriate one. So in this slide, we can see it is a screenshot of our central portal account. And here is one of the physician is trying to enter one of the HBO terms or the one clinical presentations of his patients. He got matches to select the most appropriate and the matching one with his uh, patients. And this way, assuring that the physician will accurately and rapidly enter all the clinical data related and uh, uh, Below, we can see that there is a planks through which we can enter also uh, important inf uh, clinical information regarding uh, the age of manifestation of the disease, the mood, suspected mode of inheritance, and the age of death. In this slide, we can find uh, this is the extracted HBO terms from the clinical history of our patients. Uh, uh, it's also, uh, the most important one we find that it is autosomal recessive inheritance, childhood onset, death in childhood young adult in onset, death in early adulthood, encephalopathy, mental deterioration, episodic ataxia, ataxia, nystagmus, seizures, developmental regression, tetrapheresis, coma, triggering by febrile illness, respiratory failure, and recurrent fever. So as we mentioned that our family had requested the TRIO, uh, the whole exome sequencing, and they uh, requested the design, the TRIO uh, plus whole exome, for the two affected female sub and for the parents. Uh, we were suspecting or suggesting autosomal recessive mode of inheritance from the family pedigree, and the filtration criteria applied with a minor allele frequency less than 0.01, quality score 200, CAT score more than 15. We were searching for homozygous or compound heterozygous variants that are present in both affected siblings and segregating in both parents. According to this filtration criteria, we, can we found two potential genes, which is the NEXI genes and the DNF17A gene. The NEXI genes was uh, proposed to be uh, associated with mitochondria-related neurometabolic disorder. The DNF17A gene no, was not involved in previously in any neurometabolic disorder, so it was excluded. So here in this slide and the coming slide, we are going to discuss the pathophysiological defect uh, related to the NEXI mutations. The NEXI gene is calling for a gene no, uh, for enzyme known as epimerase, which are responsible for converting from one epimer to the another. What is meant by epimer? Epimer is each of two isomers with different configurations of atoms around one of several asymmetric carbon atoms present. In this illustrative uh, diagram, uh, we will uh, discuss together the pathophysiological defect related to the NEXI mutations. So we can see that there are two important uh, genes, which is the NEXI genes and NEXD genes. They are very important part of mitochondrial repair system, and they are essential for the integrity of the mitochondria. The NEXI gene is calling for the epimerase gene, and the NEXD gene is calling for the dehydratase gene. And they are taking responsibility of detoxifications of metabolites resulting from the dehydrations of NAD, PH, and NAD, P. And both of them are electron donors in the oxidative phosphorylation process taking place inside the mitochondria. So if I have a defect in the NEXT gene or I have a defect in the NEXD gene, this will lead to the accumulations of these toxic metabolites, which in turn will leading to the blockage of uh, the enzyme system complex one, the com uh, enzyme of bioarrayed dehydrogenase, and the NADH, uh, NADH dehydrogenase, and so it will have, be, have a deleterious effect on the mitochondrial metabolism, and also leads to the uh, clinical presentations and uh, seen in our case. So what we were, uh, the, uh, the, the result of the whole exome trio plus performed in our family, we find that both females are, uh, carry our compound heterozygous for next mutations. 
the first mutation is missense mutations segregating in the father and the splice acceptor mutations segregating in the mother. And this was confirmed and validated with via Sanger. So according to the clinical uh, and the, according to the criteria present of our variants, uh, how can we are going to classify it according to the American College Medical of Medical Genetics standards and the guidelines? First of all, is our variant absent in population database? Yes. Is our patient's phenotype or family history is highly specific for this gene? No, because there are many gene, other genes with a similar clinical presentation related to the neurometabolic or mitochondrial disorders. Multiple lines of computational evidence supporting its deleterious effect on the gene and the gene product, yes. It's a co-segregating of uh, the disease in multiple affected family members, yes but I still need increasing of the segregation data to confirm its uh, uh, linkage to the disease. So according to this given criteria, I classify the variants to variant of uncertain significance. So what is missing here in our variants to be classified, reclassified to likely pathogenic variants? It's the functional culture. So actually what was performed in our, for our family is not only the trio plus whole exome sequencing, we have performed the RNA analysis, quantitative uh, real-time uh, testing, and also in addition, we have performed the Western plot. So in here in the diagram, in the chromatogram, uh, we can see in diagram A, we can see that the mother and the third female sub is the carrier of, retention of the splice acceptor mutations, which in turn resulting in retentions of interim five. This leading to regenerating of premature, generating of premature stop codon. So we can see here the double peaks in the mother and the third female sub. Below we can see the agarot gel electrophoresis with the light band of the splice acceptor mutation seen in the mother and the third female sub and its absence in the father. In diagram B here we can see the level of gene expression of the official transcript, which is higher in the control and the uh, father uh, compared to the mother and the third female sub. Below here, we can see the uh, comparison of the gene expressions of the alternative transcript with retentions of interim five, which is higher in the, sorry, which is higher here in the mother and the third female sub compared to the father and to the control. And finally, here in the Western plot, we can see through that uh, the protein is totally absent in the third female sub and it's diminished in the mother and the third female sub. And it is diminished in the father and the mother, sorry, compared to the control. So in addition to the family with two affected female sub and compound heterozygous mutations, we have two additional families with two different uh, mutations. And also in addition from our replications, uh, a whole exome sequencing data set of 4,351 patients with neurodevelopmental disorders, we're finding in addition eight patients with five different mutations. And so the total number of the patients participating in this clinical study was 13 patients. So what is the uh, strategy for gene discovery in central genes? As we mentioned previously, that uh, we have the largest repository in the world uh, with 7.3 million variants and different senators and unique variants not reported previously. And so in case of uncertainty or sometimes in case that the family has a negative results and in some time, in, uh, in many in common uh, that we can find in some patients uh, that they are sharing uh, clinical presentations, but uh, we find that they're, they're in, in their data analysis, they are related to genes of uncertain significance. And so by accumulations of the data from uh, that by the time, uh, these genes with many segregations in associations also with uh, uh, collaborations with many scientific collaborators, uh, we can uh, validate uh, the, them as a cause of a core specific phenotype. So this scenario was applied to uh, the below genes, uh, and uh, this was a gene discovered at central genes. For instance, the PTPN23 for axonal recessive brain atrophy and developmental delay, the KCTD3 for severe intellectual disability and refractory epilepsy, the, CS, uh, the SCN3A for axonal dominant encephalopathy, the BBOX for porphyria variegata, axonal recessive with developmental delay, the FRMPD4 supporting its association with extinct intellectual disability, 
and SCN, uh, SCN1P for the recessive form of Dravet syndrome. So as we mentioned that the total number of patients in this study is 3 to 13 patients, talking of them according to the clinical presentations, we can find that 12 of them have respiratory failures, 6 of them have movement disorders, 11 of them have comatose states, 9 have developmental disorder, 8 have muscle hypotonia, 8 showing a course of fluctuating disease, 6 having a correlation between fever and clinical deterioration, and six having increased lactate level in the CSF, and six where the fever and the drug were the triggering factors for the manifestations. And most of the patients died after two months to four years after the starting of manifestations. So this slide is the screenshot of our consent with the first part associated with the acceptance of reporting of the incidental finding. The below is uh, associated with the acceptance of the physicians and the patients with the storage of the data. It's very important in case of negative results or uncertain uh, variance of uncertain significance because the storage of these uh, results will make us enabling uh, us in the future if there's any, any new evidence regarding the discovery of any genes related uh, to their phenotypes or reclassification of variants and their data are available and by reanalysis of their data we pre proactively emailing them with their new results but the, this is only will occur in the scenario they accept that data should be stored. And here we come to the last part of the discussions, which is the therapeutic implications of the genetic testing in driving the medical decisions. And it's very crucial because uh, some, many times we can detect uh, disordered or metabolic or related to the neurological with approved medications, like for instance, in case of epileptic encephalopathy uh, with a proven, a new approved drugs for uh, epilepsy, a poor, a specific for epileptic uh, syndrome, and this will, should be confirmed through the genetic testing. Also, for instance, in case of biotin uh, uh, responsive disorders, uh, in uh, neuro neurotransmitter disorders, uh, this is how the whole exome sequencing and the genetic testing in general impacting the driving of the medical decisions. In our case, after understanding the physiological defect seen in our case, we can see that the deficiency of NAD precursor uh, uh, is proposed to be uh, associated with the manifestation seen in our patients. And so vitamin P3 could be considered a good drug candidate for the treatment of neurometabolic disorders related to the mitochondrial dysfunction. So the follow-up of and the response of treatment of our patients, which is the third female sub, she in March 2017, she removed the tracheostomy. April 2017, she begins treatment with vitamin B3, starting with the initial dose, 40 milligram. Then she was maintained on 40 milligram twice per day and the active form eupicanol by the coenzyme Q, 150 milligram. There was dramatic improvement in spasticity. There was improvement in fine motor skills in cognitive functional, in speech and attention, and ability to fit. In September 2019, the patient was able to use a mechanical wheelchair on her own. There was very mild limb spasticity with restrictions of movement secondary to fixed contractures, resulting in pain in the leg that disappeared after the introduction of pregabalin 50 milligram underlying these assumptions. The, the decreasing spasticity was from the fourth to the first degree on the modified Ashworth scale. In this study carried by Clark et al. 2018, he, uh, it is a meta-analysis including 37 studies of two, uh, between 2011 and 2017, including 20,068 patients, aging group from 0 to 18, about the diagnostic comparison of the diagnostic utility of whole genome, whole exome, and the chromosomal microarray. We can see here that the diagnostic utility of whole genome sequencing 41%, for whole exome sequencing 36%, Chromosomal microarray 10%, increasing with 16 per year. And this is attributed to the uh, increased awareness of the physicians about the importance of the clinical information, the quantity and the quality of the data sent to us and uh, sent with the whole exome sequencing, and also the possibility and the importance that to highlight uh, that the TRAO test is better than the SOLO regarding the mood of inheritance, uh, the approval of the segregations of the variants, and also in many situations, the reclassification also of the variants. And this study also carried by Trogellino and Pertioli and published in the European Journal of Human Genetics 2017. We can find it is, uh, uh, from the results 
the impact of HBO terms in increasing diagnostic utility of the whole exome sequencing. We can find that sending from two to five HBO terms resulting in diagnostic utility of whole exome 26% and sending up to 15 or more can result in diagnostic utility 39%. In this study, again carried by Clark et al. 2018, uh, it is also a meta-analysis regarding the medical impact of the whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and chromosomal microarray on directing the medical decision. How they, they direct the medical decisions? They are directed. Uh, for, uh, they can directed by uh, from the start by changing in diagnostic and control procedures by changing in medication or dietary management in cases for uh, metabolic disorder, for instance, with other things of dietary restrictions, also in the decisions for taking a major procedure like surgery and transplantations. And so how the uh, whole genome and whole exome and the chromosomal microarray, the percentage they impact the medical utility, we can see that the whole genome sequencing impact was 27%. Whole exome sequencing 17%, chromosomal microarray 6%. Also, the role of the whole exome and the whole genome in seriously ill pediatric patients is well documented in those who are admitted in the NICU and the PICU with high positive results ranging from 43 to 73 in severely ill children. Also, it's, a, it, it's also directing the medical decisions, as we mentioned, by directing the treatment. Changing in drug was detected by 19% in those type of patients. Also, if we started the, the analysis or the testing very early, it may result in turn in reducing the length of the stay in the NICU and the BICU because sometimes we can start medications or dietary management that preventing the sequelae or the complications that can occur later in turn reducing morbidity and mortality, also in turn reducing the care and the hospitalization cost. And finally, we come to the conclusions that the NGS technologies are contributing to the characterization also of the new genes and the discovery of newly involved genes. HBO terms had a great impact on increasing diagnostic utility of the genetic testing. Whole exome sequencing is considered as an invaluable tool for discovering new genes and driving the medical decision. Okay, thank you for uh, your listening and your patience. And I'm open to any questions to help you so. Thank you, Haber, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, let us now move on the question and answer part of the webinar. I see that we have received several questions from our participants. Uh, the question number one, what is the functional study strategy we apply in Centagene? Okay, this is a very good question because we are going to explain what are the type of functional study and what is related to which category of disorders. If we are talking about the category of metabolic disorders, yes, we are performing this type of functional study because it's related to enzyme, uh, uh, this, uh, enzyme level or it is a biomarkers. And in the last few years, we have innovated many biomarkers that in the specific for specific uh, metabolic disorders that uh, helping in the screening, in the treatment, and in the prognosis also of the disorders. If we are talking about different functional studies like zebra fish or something like induced pluripotent stem cell, uh, we know unfortunately we are not performing this type of functional study in centrogenes, but nevertheless, we are strong scientific collaborators to many scientific researchers all around the world. And as we mentioned previously, that we have huge data and a large number, uh, more than 7.3 billion million variants with 58% uh, of these variants are unique. And see, it's very common that many of them come to us previously for uh, and uh, at, at, at starting from the publications, uh, asking about if uh, these variants are present in house or not. And so we are strong scientific collaborators to many researchers all around the world. Thank you, Haber. Um, let us move on to the next question. Uh, what is the difference between requesting additional research report from the central portal and the acceptance of research data storage in the consent form? Okay, uh, we can, uh, starting with the additional uh, report uh, requesting the research uh, variants, we, and this is only uh, available in case of negative results, of course. Uh, tier two uh, genes, what are the genes or the genes under the category of genes will not be reported if, except in the case of negative 
results and also if they are have been requested from the physician to be uh, to request them they should be done through the center portal by requesting this is quite different from the uh, acceptance of the storage of research uh, of uh, your data which is seen in the consent the consent has a, a part related to the acceptance of the physicians and the patients for the uh, storage of the research data and this is related also for negative results and those who have uncertainty uh, because uh, with the time and with the accumulations of data and with the availability of new evidence regarding the new genes related to their phenotypes, it's possible that uh, by time they have got the results and by availability of their data, we can do off reanalysis and proactively emailing them with their new results. This will no, uh, not be done except with their acceptance. Uh, this is the part of the concept. And so we can see the difference. The consent is the acceptance of the storage of the data, but the other type of uh, additional report is related differently to the acceptance, to the, uh, 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 the type uh, that we are reporting a different uh, form of genes, which is the genes of uncertain significance. Okay. So uh, we have uh, also here some questions that I can see. Uh, one of these questions is what is the minimum and the maximum size of CMV reported uh, in West? So uh, this is also very good questions uh, regarding the CMV because we have many questions regarding the different resolutions that we are covering by different techniques. We can start with uh, uh, the microarray. Uh, the microarray detecting our microarrays can detect uh, these uh, deletions are uh, uh, more than 100 kilobits per and duplications more than uh, 200 kilobits per. Regarding the whole exome sequencing, we can, uh, different the resolutions, we can detect uh, the uh, exome deletions at the level of uh, homozygous mutations at the level of an exome. And uh, for heterozygous mutations, we can detect it at a level of three exomes. Regarding the whole genome sequencing, we can detect in deletions uh, up to 50, starting from 50 bits there, and duplications from 100 bits there. And so we can see here that the CMV's resolutions is different in our different techniques. Uh, I have also other questions regarding what do you see the futures of CMV versus C -O -O uh, CME, uh, chromosomal microarray versus whole genome sequencing. Okay, uh, I can see that the whole genome sequencing will be considered, and it's now al already considered the first tier diagnostic test uh, because it covers different CMB resolutions, very small and very large also resolutions of CMA, of uh, CMBs. Uh, also, it covers in addition in tronic coding and non-coding mutations, uh, but uh, the CMA, uh, is limited only to, to uh, the chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, uh, in addition, also, I can see that the CMA is, have only uh, still been uh, requested from the physician side at uh, the first uh, diagnostic test in certain categories like dysmorphic features, uh, like specific features or specific patients of chromosomal abnormality. But with time, I think the whole genome sequencing will take its place at the first year diagnostic test. But uh, CMA still also have uh, first uh, capabilities in cancer, a uh, specific uh, field in cancer in detection of loss of homozygosity. But from, uh, from more the public, all of the publications, and most of the publications now supporting the whole genome sequencing at the first year diagnostic test. We have an additional question also, in what situations we need to consider whole exome sequencing plus CMV analysis. Okay, I can see that uh, we have to consider whole exome with CMV analysis by default in any case. Why? Because the CMV is representing 10% of mutations, and this is not a low percentage. And it's very common that I can have a mutation deletion duplications in my gene not captured if I request whole exome only. So it's better for all the physicians and to request the whole exome with CMV as to increase the diagnostic utility of the test. Uh, in addition, also we have two uh, another questions uh, about a case. We have two boys patients with mental retardations who ordered uh, 
uh, tray whole genome, uh, whole exome sequencing uh, with CMV, and uh, the result was uh, normal. So what we uh, you recommend? I recommend only uh, all in, in the from the start, the first point that I recommend from the start to send more additional clinical information. As we see in the presentation, that the clinical information is very uh, important, have a great impact on increasing the diagnostic facility of the test. And I need to an additions to know uh, what the patients are suffering, uh, clinical presentations regarding uh, neurological presentations. They have normal tone, they have normal reflexes, they have uh, normal measurements. If there, there is family history uh, of similar conditions, if uh, they have uh, scans, if they have done investigations, all this information is very important about the clinical course of the disease, so as to help uh, the theme for annotations and uh, prioritizations of variants. And uh, in such case, I recommend to proceed to whole genome sequencing because the intronic mutations have made it possible that they have a gene with the intronic mutation not captured by the whole uh, exome sequencing. So again, the questions regarding the uh, whole genome sequencing uh, and uh, whether it covers the variants detected by the CMA. I think, again, we are uh, uh, highlighting that the whole genome sequencing is now considered as uh, the first tier diagnostic test uh, covering different CMV resolutions in addition to the intronic mutations also and coding and non-coding variants. Uh, it's, it's considered now the first tier diagnostic test. It's very limited now that we can see physicians uh, uh, starting with the CMA in their uh, work up, uh, but uh, still the CMA can detect such certain disorders not uh, can be detected by whole genome like loss of heterozygosity. But for the most of the cases, we can see now that the whole genome sequencing can cover uh, many cases related to the CMA. Uh, so at the, at, at the end, uh, other one, uh, what do you, uh, so you recommend whole genome sequencing for the, uh, the post, uh, 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 both boys, for the two boys? Yes, okay. I recommend, yes, I do recommending uh, whole genome sequencing, but all, uh, on the previously, we have to send more clinical information. I think we don't have uh, any more questions. Uh, okay, I think this is all what I have. And uh, I would like to thank all the audience and uh, if still they have questions in mind, I, if they have anything that I, uh, needs medical aid, they can send me there. Uh, questions and inquiries via mail, and this my mail is appearing on the screen, uh, and it will be my pleasure also to help them anytime. Thank you, Haber, very much for sharing your insights, and thank you to all the participants for joining our webinar series. We hope you are able to take away useful information on this very important topic. We are going to launch a poll now, allowing you to give feedback and enabling us to further improve our educational webinars. Please take a few minutes to fill it out. And please join us for the next webinar on May 26 about hereditary angioedema and autosomal dominant in inherited disease that often is under or might misdiagnosed. Once again, thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Rita, and thank you all. Uh, hoping you a good day and stay healthy and stay safe, all of you. Thank you.